continuing with the Acts overview. We made it to Acts chapter 6. And in Acts chapter 6, the apostles choose seven men. And Stephen is one of them. Stephen is an important character. In Acts 6, 8 through 10, it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. You see, if you're doing anything worth anything, you're going to have some people disputing with you. And if what you got to say is from the Lord, they're going to see the wisdom and the spirit in you. And it says in verse 15, And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Now this kind of reminds you of when Moses' face shone in the Old Testament. He had to put a veil over it. And when you get in the Bible so much, it will make your countenance change. When you get in the Bible, it will make your countenance change. People will see the wisdom and they'll see the spirit. And even if you're an unlearned and ignorant man, they'll be able to see that you've been with Jesus. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. And you're going to see Stephen again in Acts chapter 7. Stephen preaches like an overview of the Old Testament. And I see that in the Bible where I've seen Jesus go back in the Old Testament. I've seen Paul, of course, go back in the Old Testament and just expound on it. And that's why I, I went through the Old Testament doing overviews of each book. And here, Stephen is going to give you an overview of the entire Old Testament. And also in chapter 7, you find the, this, in this chapter, you find the final rejection of Jesus Christ by the Jews. And something will change after Acts chapter 7. But in Acts chapter 7, 52 and 54, Stephen says, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. So, when you preach it right and straight, it will make the religious crowd angry. They gnashed on him with their teeth. Stephen is about to become a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ right after preaching a whole overview of the Old Testament. If you want an overview of the Old Testament, read Acts chapter 7. And in Acts chapter 7, 55, it says, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. You see, Stephen looks up and sees that. Jesus is standing instead of sitting. Because most likely, if the Jews had accepted him as their Messiah, then Jesus was coming back at that moment. But they didn't. So the Lord postponed the kingdom with the time period we're in now, the church age. And for this will be about for about 2,000 years. And here we are. We're close to the rapture, the tribulation, and the second coming. Acts 7.56 And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So there is probably that door in the cloud again. It seems there is an entrance in the clouds. And if someone in heaven opens that door, from the other side, you could see right into the third heaven, just like Stephen is here. He's looking up. You know what I mean? He's not got supernatural eyesight to where he can see all the way to, you know, up into the third heaven. So most likely, someone from the other side opened a door in the clouds, and he can see right on into the third heaven that way. The clouds seem to have some teleportation aspects to them. And I mean, that's just speculation, but... You know, how was how does Stephen see the Son of Man all the way in the third heaven if this wasn't so? I mean, obviously, you know, God could just allow him to see it, like a vision of it. And that's a possibility too. 
But in Acts 7, 57 through 58, Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. So this man Saul is another main character. You also know him as the Apostle Paul. And before his conversion, he persecuted Christians. Acts seven fifty nine and 60. And they stoned Stephen, calling him, uh, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That's what Stephen said. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. So Stephen dies here and became a martyr for Jesus Christ. And in chapters 8 th through 9, you will see a switch. Remember, I told you you'll see a change. You'll see a switch from Jewish to a Gentile ministry. In Acts 5, the gospel is preached in Samaria. In Acts 9, the apostle Paul is converted, and he would later become the apostle to the Gentiles. And in chapters 8 through 28, the kingdom of God is preached and spread throughout the world. But you'll notice the switch now. You see, that was the final rejection there. In Acts chapter 7, for the Jews, and now it's switching to the Gentiles. So Acts chapter 8 up shows the apostle to the Gentiles. You're going to see Saul persecutes the church. And you know the apostle Paul... That's Saul, and he wrote the Pauline epistles. You see, he's also called Saul in the scriptures, and before he was saved, he persecuted the church. It says in Acts 8, 3, And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women committed them to prison. This is on the way. This is something you're going to see soon in this country. It's on the way. Men are going to begin to make havoc of the church. You've already heard about churches being bombed and all types of things like that. Um, you're going to be persecuted just for going. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch also show up in this chapter. The Ethiopian eunuch is a Gentile. It's so like I said, it's you're going to see a switch. In Acts 8, 36 through 37, And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, Here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So you see that uh, he says, What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip says, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. So the requirement before you get baptized is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you you shouldn't just... It doesn't make sense for somebody to baptize a baby because that baby can't believe the gospel before he's baptized. It doesn't make sense to baptize somebody for salvation because the salvation is the believing. The, the, the water baptism is something you do after you get saved. Notice Philip requires a believer, requires a person to be a believer before he's baptized. And in Acts 8, 38 through 39, And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip. And the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. So the Spirit of the Lord just picked Philip up and teleported him somewhere else. It called him away. In Acts chapter 9, you got the conversion of Saul. In Acts 9.1, it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men 
which journeyed with them, stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, and they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. So you have the greatest enemy of the church turning into a saint of God here in Acts chapter 9. And in chapters 10 through 12, the church at Antioch begins. Acts 10, Peter gives the gospel to Cornelius. Once again showing it as a switching from Jews to Gentiles. And now the Lord is primarily going to be dealing with the Gentiles. And the Jews are going to be temporarily blinded. Right now, even today, they're blind in part. And Peter has a vision that, that shows to him that the Gentiles are clean. And the Gentiles receive the Holy Ghost and speak with tongues in this chapter. And the tongues were a sign to the unbelieving Jews who were present. They were unbelieving in the sense they didn't think the Gentiles could get the Holy Ghost. But look what happens in Acts ten forty four through 47. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. The circumcision there, that's the Jews. They were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. So you see, they were unbelieving and that they didn't believe that the Gentiles could get the Holy Ghost. But it says in verse 46, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So you see, the tongues aren't for someone to look spiritual. They were to confirm what was going on to unbelieving Jews so that they would believe. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 22, Tongues are for a sign. And in 1 Corinthians 1, 22, The Jews require a sign. And then Peter says, Can any, for, any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Notice that they received the Holy Ghost before they were baptized. Proving salvation is before baptism. Proving that there's a transition going on in the book of Acts because you remember in Acts 2, you had some people that got the Holy Ghost when they believed, or when they got baptized. You see, the book of Acts is a transitional book. You shouldn't just take things out of the book of Acts alone and, and apply that as doctrine for yourself. Because today you get the Holy Ghost the moment you believe the gospel. And that's Paul confirms that in the book of Ephesians and in other places. But here, they... They got the Holy Ghost before they were baptized. And notice Acts 10.48, And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they, to, prayed they him to tarry certain days. Now Acts chapter 11, this is the first time the word Christian appears. In Acts 11.25 and 26, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So these people were assembling together and being taught. You have all these people that uh, say, you shouldn't be taught by man. The Holy Ghost will teach you. You just got to get in the Bible and the Holy Ghost will teach you. But through the Bible, you see men teaching other men. You see, God uses men. But they were called Christians first in Antioch. This sets up Antioch as a good place in the Scriptures. While Egypt represents the world in the Scriptures. In Acts chapter 12, Peter is imprisoned and James is killed. Remember how I told you that the devotional or inspirational aspect of the book of Acts was rejoice and that you're counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. You see through all the book of Acts, the saints just suffering shame and imprisonment and being martyred and stoned. In Acts 12, 1 and 2. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church and he killed James the brother of John, 
with the sword. So you see them being killed off. And uh, Peter is imprisoned. But then he gets rescued by the angel of the Lord and he busts him out of prison. You see, uh, a lot of people like prison movies or escape from prison movies. Well, you got that in the Bible. And then also in this chapter, you got Herod getting killed. In Acts 12, 21 through 24, it shows you Herod, who's a type of the Antichrist. It says, And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made oration unto them. That's what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to sit on a throne. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. That's what they're going to say about the Antichrist. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. <coughs> Excuse me. But the word of the word of God grew and multiplied. This is how God feels about you accepting glory that should go to him. And when a wicked man like Herod is taken out, the word of God grew and multiplied. I would hate to be the person who is in the way of the word of God growing and multiplying. Herod was in the way of it, so God takes him out. Acts 13, Barnab Paul and Barnabas at Cyrus. That's what you have, and that's the first missionary trip into Gentile territory. It says in Acts 13, 6 through 8, And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so was his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. So you'll notice this guy withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. You're going to see this when you get out doing personal work and things, whether it be at work or anywhere. There's going to be somebody who's spiritual, but it's a devilish thing, and they're going to withstand you and seek to turn away from from any from seek to turn away anybody that's coming to you. They want to turn them away from the faith, and they'll withstand you. Like you can be witnessing to somebody. Uh, and, and telling them how to be saved, and you're going to find that this person tries to start correcting you on your doctrine while you're trying to get the person saved. They don't care about the person's soul. They've never told that person how to be saved. They just care about defending their belief. And see, you believe that it, to be saved, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. They believe you've got to do all these other things to be saved. So they're offended by what you're saying. And while you're telling that person how to be saved, they're going to start correcting you and seek to turn away that person from the faith. They're going to withstood you, withstand you. Just like this Elimus the sorcerer. And you'll notice in the scriptures, though, that God's men always outdo the devil's men. Just like Moses outdid, you know, Jannes and Jambres, the magicians back there. It says in Acts 13, 9 through 11, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. So Saul, uh, Paul is filled with the Holy Ghost here, and he looks at him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? So he says he's full of subtlety, he's full of mischief. He calls him a child of the devil, an enemy of righteousness, and says he perverts the right ways of the Lord. That's like five things he said there to him in one sentence. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. So you see, uh, that's what's probably, what it's probably going to be like for the two witnesses, or for the 144,000 in the tribulation. When people try to come at them like that, they're going to be able to just smite them with blindness, things like that. So, the sorcerer gets his lights knocked out. God's men always outdo the devil's men. 
you see that they're they're superior because God's the one behind what the what his men are doing and the devil's men is what is behind what the devil's men are doing and God is much greater than the devil in chapter 14 Paul and Barnabas at Iconium and at Lystra Paul stoned at Lystra it says in Acts 14 19 through 20 and there came to their certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead howbeit his as the disciples stood round about him he rose up and came into the city and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. This is a good illustration of you can't keep a good man down. He came, he rose up, and he came into the city. So Paul's, Paul goes through so much stuff in his life. He gets his eyes blinded, he stays in fastings, and now here he's getting stoned to death, but then he still gets back up. You see, if God's not through with you, then, you know, he's not through with you. He's just going to let you just keep getting back up. You know, the, like the Rocky movies, he just keeps on getting back up. And Paul would greatly outdo any fighter or boxer. He just keeps on getting back up. And in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 28, and, they, and are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. And labors more abundant, and stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often in cold and nakedness. But that, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So you see, that's some things that Paul went through. Constantly being persecuted. Constantly being threatened with death. And not pampering the flesh. Always got something going on that's hard on the flesh. In Acts 15... The council at Jerusalem settles the issue of grace versus law. You see, you got men going around saying to be saved, you got to be circumcised and believe. You got to be circumcised, keep the law, and believe. While the Bible believers believed to, to be saved, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 15, one of certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses... You cannot be saved. Now today you don't hear people going around saying that you had to have to be circumcised to be saved. But you do have men going around saying, repent, believe, be baptized, and believe. Or repent, believe, confess, and be baptized. They think water baptism has a part in saving you. You see, there's always the temptation for man to add something to the gospel. And verse 2 in Acts 15 says, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no, no small dissension and, di and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So they go up and they talk about this, this matter. And it says in verse 5, but, but there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So they had circumcision and keeping the law. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe? And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. So Peter gets up and defends salvation by grace through faith. And in Romans 3, 9, it says, What then, are we better than they? No, and no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. So both Jews and Gentiles are under sin. Both Jews and Gentiles need a Savior. 
Both Jews and Gentiles get saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, putting their trust on him to be their crucified, buried, and risen Savior. And Peter says in verse 10 and 11, Now therefore, why tempt ye God? You put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So both Jews and Gentiles, they get in the same way. They both got an equal opportunity to be saved. A Jew's not saved just because he's a Jew. He's guilty. A Gentile is guilty as well. They both need to be saved. They go both come through the same way. In Ephesians 2.16, it says, And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So it says, Reconcile both, both Jew and Gentile. So Peter and the apostles all agree, Salvation is by grace through faith without keeping the law. Or by being circumcised. It's not by being circumcised. It's not by keeping the law. It's not by being a good person. It's by grace, through faith, without works. Galatians 5.2 Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. So all these people going around saying you had to be circumcised to be saved, that was a false teaching corrected by both Peter and Paul. In chapters 16 through 18, you have the second missionary trip. And around this time, Paul is probably writing 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. So in Acts 16, Timothy joins Paul and Silas. In Acts 16, 1 through 3, it says, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewish, a Jewish and believed, but his father was a Greek which was well, well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. So this Timothy here, this is the Timothy of First and Second Timothy. And so Timothy joins Paul and Silas, and in Acts sixteen twenty six through 31, you got the famous verses about the Philippian jailer, believing it says and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and every man everyone's bands were loosed and the keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open he drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had been fled but paul cried with a loud voice saying do thyself no harm for we are all here then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Did they say, Be baptized, be circumcised, keep the law? They didn't say none of those things. They didn't say live a good life. They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And a lot of people are against easy believism. And if by easy believism they mean that a person can just say a prayer and not even mean it in their heart, then you know that is wrong. But that would be more called easy prayerism to me. To say easy believism is, implies to lost people that it takes more than just believing. But it's the believing that saves you come to Jesus Christ as the guilty sinner that you are. You know you're a sinner. You know you need a Savior. You know the gospel. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know anything else. You need to know you're a sinner because that's why you need a Savior. You need to know you're, you need a Savior because you know you're a sinner. And then you need to know what the Savior did for you. He died on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood. He was buried and resurrected. And you come to him as a sinner and put your faith on him and what he did for you on the cross to be your payment for sin. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't require anything else. What you did before that moment and what you do after that moment is a completely separate issue from the salvation itself. And if you can get that in your head, then you're going to be right on salvation. 
you, people spend too much time, especially preachers, spend too much time on what people did before salvation. Did they commit this certain sin? Were they a reprobate? Uh, and then they spend too much time what people on what people do after salvation. Are they showing this list of requirements that I think a person ought to have in their life to prove their salvation? That's what they're focused on. They take the focus off of salvation and put the focus on what they see with their eyes. When it comes to salvation, when a person thinks, I don't know if I'm saved or not, or am I really saved? They don't need to think back of what they did before salvation or the things that they're doing after salvation. The focus should be on, was there a time when I came to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Not, well, I'm doing this certain sin. I don't think I could possibly be saved. Or, I committed this certain sin before I was saved, so therefore I probably really didn't get saved. See, when you start when you start saying that a certain person can't be saved because of this certain sin or because that they're a reprobate, and when you start saying that you can't, you, if you're committing a certain sin, then you probably really didn't get saved, that's causing people to focus on their self for, and what they're doing for salvation than to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did the work. The only works that are required for salvation, Jesus already did. He did all the work. He paid the sacrifice. You come to him and believe. And a lot of people, if you use Acts 16.31, they say that you just take one verse. No, no. There's plenty of verses that show you it's by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you just use Acts 16.31, which I don't, but if you, anytime you say it, you know, people say, well, you just think you can live however you want to. Never in my life have I said a person should just live however they want to. And I may even have more higher moral standards than you, for all you know. Uh, this may be in your future, though, what's, what's going on here. Paul and Silas in prison. And you have a role reversal. Instead of you going, getting the prisoners saved... You may be the prisoner getting the free man saved. You see, I, I hear a lot of preachers who go to prisons, and that's good, telling them how to be saved there, the, the inmates. And um, that may be a role reversal to where later they're in prison getting the guards saved because it's getting pretty bad. And in Acts 17 and Acts 17 too, and Paul, as his manner was, went into them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. When you reason with people, make sure it is out of the Scriptures. And you see, God is reasonable. He reasons with you. And Isaiah 118, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, that they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Acts 17, 3, an opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I have preached unto you, is Christ. So Paul preached the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection. And it had to be done, because that is the only way we could get our sin paid for. In Acts 17, 11, it says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So we need to search the scriptures daily. Remember how I told you that God uses men to teach men. And you just search the scriptures daily to make sure what they're saying is so. And not just on Sunday, not just on Wednesday, but every day we need to search the scriptures daily. In Acts 18, you've got Paul in Corinth. And you're going to see in chapters 19 through 20, you have the third missionary trip. And I'm going to uh, stop with Acts 18 and pick up on this later.